How many times have you been alone in the privacy of your own home, partaking in some casual but discreet Googling? only to later be barraged by advertisements around the very product that you were trying to keep on the down low. Or maybe you're talking with some friends about doing something fun like rock climbing, and then later on that evening, almost if by magic, you start to see advertisements for local rock climbing gyms in your Instagram feed. Well, this video is gonna explain exactly what's going on when this happens. Specifically, how modern applications are tracking and operationalizing your data, and why it's probably much worse than you even imagine. I'm gonna answer questions whether companies like Facebook and Google are listening to your conversations. I'll also introduce an exclusive new concept called co-browsing or session replay that virtually no one is even aware of. And finally, we'll talk about whether these practices are good for users and ultimately even ethical. Anyways, let's get started. But first, why should you listen to me on the matter? Well, digital analytics and tracking has quite literally been my occupation for the last 10 years. I've been able to write code for top companies and some of that code might even be on your phone right now. So I've been able to peek behind the curtain and see what these companies are actually doing. See, there is a war raging right now in cyberspace. On one hand, you have giant tech companies capturing more and more data about their users. And on the other hand, you have a grassroots movement of products and legislation to help put the ownership of that data back into users' hands. We've seen the rise of services like DuckDuckGo, which is a search engine that actively does not track you. We've seen things like the Brave browser, which puts privacy front and center. You know, Google Chrome has announced they're dropping support for third-party cookies, and Apple has introduced more tracking transparency into their mobile development process. We've even seen legislation introduced, both at the federal and state level, to help introduce mandates around how companies can manage their users' data. And real quick, if you like this video, go ahead and click that like button. Otherwise, in the spirit of this video, I might have to track you down, Liam Neeson style. I will look for you. I will find you. So what exactly is happening when it feels like these companies are tracking your activity across the internet? Well, first you need to understand something called retargeting. In its most common form, the way retargeting works is a company like Facebook will issue something called a tracking pixel to companies that are trying to sell a product. And those companies will put the tracking pixel on their website. So say I go to a rock climbing gym website, I get pixeled by the Facebook pixel and it writes a cookie to my browser that basically says Tim looked for this rock climbing gym. So later when I'm scrolling through a different application or on a different website and I see in my feed an advertisement for that same product what they're doing is they are retargeting me based on my search history behavior. And this is a common practice because companies know that an advertisement's efficacy will be increased greatly if the lead pool is warm or targeted in some way as opposed to being a cold lead. And if it costs money to put an ad in front of someone's eyes, then companies naturally are gonna wanna put the ad in front of a qualified lead Lead instead of a cold lead. As a side note, we should probably move away from the hunting terminology like tracking and targeting because it doesn't really portray marketers in the best light, but I digress. Now I know my viewers are a bit more technical in nature, so I would be remiss not to show you exactly how this tracking takes place. So the way it works is companies usually leverage third-party tools to do this tracking on their behalf. And the way they install that is on mobile applications, they'll use an SDK. And on web apps, they'll just use a little JavaScript tag. Once the install is complete, that user data will begin flowing into those 
those analytics platform servers and it becomes available for consumption by the key stakeholders. I can show a perfect example if we go to nike.com. So I just have the network tab open and you can see as I load the page, we start to see calls to these third party analytics tools. These calls are usually called tracking pixels or beacon calls. Now most of these tools will take this data and make it available in tables, charts, pie graphs, and heat maps. But this is rapidly changing with the introduction of a new concept called session replay or co-browsing. What this capability lets you do is instead of viewing a table or a chart, it actually lets you watch the session as if it were a movie. They can see you log in and perform certain functions, but more importantly, they can see where you get frustrated and start rage clicking as you experience friction trying to complete your intended action. And although this might sound creepy, keep in mind two important things. One is that they do remove your personal information, so they still can't see who you are. And two, these replays are incredibly valuable for product teams to understand user friction. Apps are not perfect, and pretty regularly I find myself in a position where I'm trying to transact and actually give a company money, but the application just isn't responding properly. Well, Session Replay gives the company the ability to, in effect, come over my shoulder and see exactly where I'm experiencing that friction. So it introduces a new level of empathy. And this is huge in fostering a process of continuous product improvement. So our companies like Facebook and Google actively listening to our conversations from the microphone in our mobile devices? The short answer, really the only answer is no. The reality is companies like Facebook are so effective at targeting ads that sometimes it feels like the only way they could be doing that is by eavesdropping on us. But let's take an example. Say you're at a party and a friend starts telling you about a new rock climbing gym that they started going to. Then later on in that evening, you see advertisements for a local rock climbing gym show up in your Instagram feed. What has actually happened here is Facebook has pegged you as a look lookalike audience for a targeted ad that has already proven to work on your friend. Keep in mind the information that Facebook does have about you. They know your social network, they may know your contacts in your phone, they may also know where you are based on your IP address or other social posts that were made. Facebook knows which friends are within close proximity to you geographically. And as a result, it's not hard to see why Facebook might be inclined to show you an advertisement for a local gym that proved to work on a close friend. And fortunately for us, this is all possible without any eavesdropping. So what kind of data are apps tracking? Typically it's user behavior data. Things like total daily number of visitors, total add to carts, cart value, dwell time on pages, all the different pages a user hit, uh, conversion values, subtotals, totals, uh, and a whole host of performance metrics. Now another really interesting thing they track is your location. Now this isn't perfect and the way this works is every client device has what's called a client facing public IP address and there are third party tools such as MaxMind that serve as a IP address lookup table. So when they capture your client facing IP address, they can then take that to a third party and say, hey, where did this originate from? What was your best approximation? Now, it's not a perfect solution. As you get more granular going from country to state to city to zip code, it becomes less and less accurate. But generally speaking, companies can understand where you're located based on your IP address. Now, in addition to that, an application or a browser can request that you give them access to your GPS card. Card. And if you do that, you are giving them your precise location. So this is a little bit more risky and you want to be a little bit more careful about who you give access to that information. Similarly, using something like a VPN would actually nullify this sort of tracking because it essentially obfuscates your IP address. So how are companies operationalizing the data that they capture when you're using their applications? And the answer is 
twofold. First, these companies need to be able to track everything going on within their application so that they can report on the direction of their key performance indicators. So for instance, if you take like a banking application, they want to know how many people log in. They might want to know things around money movement. If you make a Zelle transfer, an internal transfer, a mobile check deposit, a wire transfer. Similarly, a retailer will want to track the number of orders, the total conversion value, and then maybe some downstream metrics like add to cart and new signups and things like that. And once this data is tracked, it can be made available to key stakeholders in visualization tools like Google Data Studio. The second and more interesting usage of this data is for product and developer operations teams to better understand where their application, where their product is falling short. No app is perfect, and as the technical footprint expands, it becomes harder and harder to maintain and ensure a high quality customer experience. As things stop working, or maybe the user interface becomes unintuitive, you start to see telltale signs that users are experiencing friction. Things like page reloads, or clicking the back button, or rage clicking some button, or even the way they might move their cursor in circular motions as they look for things, that's a phenomenon called nesting. And this friction can be a result of things like coding errors, uh, server downtime, or just unintuitive user interfaces. And these companies track the prevalence of these issues so that they can react quickly and remediate issues that are hampering their end users from converting or completing their intended action. So we covered what they are tracking, but something that I would like to call out is what are they not tracking? Most companies will block or proactively not capture things like personal identification information, uh, personal credit card information, and personal health information. Although they might have this information on their first party servers on the back end, they rarely share this data with their digital analytics partners. And the reason they do this is because the analytics tools don't actually need this information. They don't need to know who you are because the utility of those analytics platforms is usually the aggregate data. Additionally, many of these companies don't want to incur the liability that comes along with storing some of this information. For instance, if a company decides to store PCI information or even lets it touch their servers, then they expose themselves to additional liability and they also have to undergo a lengthy annual PCI audit process. Similarly, any personal information like user credentials, account names, account balances, that is usually not captured because it's really not helpful in how the companies are trying to purpose this data. So here's the million dollar question. How should we feel about these practices? You know, I often hear people decry these practices as invasions of privacy with otherwise nefarious intentions. But when I look really close, that's not what I'm seeing. Detractors usually begin their argument by lamenting the fact that, you know, big tech companies like Google are just collecting too much data in an underhanded way without enough transparency. And frankly, this baffles me because if we look at Google's mission statement, it literally states that the mission is to organize and make useful the world's information. So in my mind, their intention is right there in the mission statement. And then just intuitively thinking, you know, are they collecting this data because they have some maniacal plan to exploit us? Or is it just that if I want to know where a coffee shop is near me, they kind of need to know where I'm located. To be honest, I just think it's the latter. Now I recognize this is a hot take and a bit more contrarian. So if you do want to defy me on this point, feel free to go throw it in the comments. I'm always up for a healthy debate. In conclusion, it's clear to me that we are entering the age of metricization, which means everything is going to have analytics attached to it because analytics is a value add to any software or hardware product. You know, something like an Aura Ring fitness tracker is a great example of how we are now gathering data where we previously were not. And this data is around my health, my exercise, and my sleep. And although that may seem a little rudimentary, what this does is it enables a powerful optimization and feedback system. 
So now I can try things and see what comes out the other end in the data that's being captured. And this has allowed me to understand my body better and be able to discover that things like eating meals late at night or drinking any liquids past 6 p.m. hampers the quality of my sleep and I can prove it, it's there in the data. And businesses are just doing the same thing because information around customer friction within their applications helps them understand the friction points, fix those, and improve their bottom line, but also improve the customer experience journey. And yes, I'm holding out hope that these companies will continue to be responsible around their usage of this data and not uh, abuse their powers and join the dark side. So there you have it, how apps are actually tracking you. Anyways, do not leave this video without subscribing to my channel so you don't miss out on the latest and greatest around emerging tech. And as always, thanks for listening.